I'd like to start by acknowledging the tradition of owners of the land in which we meet and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future. I'd like to also acknowledge that I think the reason I'm here today is much more to do with money than anything else. I was asked to talk about the Medical Research Future Fund. I should point out, just to keep the record absolutely straight about this, I chair the advisory board that advises the minister and government how to spend the money. I have personally no control whatsoever over how the dollars are spent. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a little comment on ageing at the beginning because that was what Sally mentioned. And then I will talk about the work that I presented last week that Sally heard about the papillon virus vaccines deployment worldwide. And then I will come back to the Medical Research Future Fund at the end and give you plenty of time to ask questions once I've gone through some of the rather more boring stuff that I have to say about that. So, uh, if we, well, that's the title I was given. That's the Translational Research Institute for those of you who wish to defect to Brisbane. It's actually a very nice building. Uh, we focus on, funnily enough, translational research. Um, I am very concerned about the sustainable provision of health in the future, and one of the reasons why I've been involved with the Medical Research Future Fund and agreed to take that job on was because I saw that there might be some potentials within the Medical Research Future Fund for doing something about sustainable uh, health. This graph, which you can't really see the detail on, is one that you will all be familiar with. The blue color shows the exponential growth of the population on this planet over the course of the last 100 years. The red line shows the actual incremental growth, the, the rate per year, if you like, and you can see that that peaked a while ago and the population is not increasing quite as fast as it used to. But nevertheless, one of the challenges that we face is a growing population, and particularly in our part of the world, an aging population. Our grandchildren are going to be at the bottom of that pyramid there, trying to find the funding to support us and our parents as we grow older. And it is, in fact, a pyramid of that shape in this country now, with the, with the aging population being a larger part of the population than the people who are actually producing the money to pay for health care. So we do need to consider that. And on top of that, we have this problem that the whole world is changing as, how, as to how it sees health care. And that the person who is sick now consults the medical profession last, not first. Dr. Google gets a look in first, what's in the newspapers do, television chat shows do, and finally the patient will come and consult the doctor. So that the pyramid has been inverted as regards to where we fit into the healthcare system. This does make life difficult for us, and we have to recognize that uh, we're going to have to meet the challenge of the increasing cost of health for looking after the elderly as time goes by. Now, uh, using history as a measure, well, this thing sort of works and sometimes doesn't. I wonder if I can get that so it really works. Because it works half the time and not half the time. Sorry, yes, okay. So that this is is there any other way we can control this? Because that works intermittently at best. Um, so that uh, so yeah, I think it's really okay. Okay, let's try it again. See if we can get it working. So this is Sir William Mosler, and he had a solution for the aging problem, which of course you've all read by now, so it's taken my punchline. <laughs> but uh, let's see. He, he envisaged a college where men retired at the age of 67 after being given a year to settle their affairs and peacefully extinguish them. Uh, look, it's very effective. Uh, it saves a lot of money. Uh, uh, but I'm getting, I'm 64 going on 65, and I'm getting awfully near to that line. I would point out that Sir William did not practice what he preached. If you can, those of you who can do a quick sum will realize that he actually reached the age of 70 before he passed on. So we'd probably have to do somewhat better than that. Uh, but it is worth pointing out that uh, community health measures have been the things that have given us the greatest value in improving uh, longevity on this planet over the last 150 years. The line just shows the, exponen the exponential, well it's actually the linear increase in ageing, uh, the age of average death on this planet since 1840. Uh, prior to 1840 it was pretty much a flat line on average, but from 1840 
two revolutions made a big difference. One was the agricultural revolution, and the other was the industrial revolution. Could have been the French and the American revolutions, but it wasn't. It was agricultural and industrial. And that gave us safe food and water and a huge increase in life expectancy, particularly in the industrialized world. The, of course, my interest in infectious disease, vaccines and antibiotics added a considerable amount onto that in the 20th century. And all the rest of medical research, just a tidy little bit at the top. Uh, but of course, that's not really what life is about. It's not necessarily about how long you live. It's about what quality of life you have. And our burden now is not so much of infectious disease, although that may well come back in the future with antibiotic resistance and spread of pandemic spread of new viruses, but rather with chronic disease and the consequences of that. So the economists, and I'm sure there might be a couple of economists in the room here, there usually are, they're very interested in uh, cost effectiveness of the health services. And this is a graph that we use when writing the McKeon Committee report, basically pointing out that you can value individual services according to the value in terms of quality adjusted years of life that you get versus the cost. And obviously I'm interested in the bottom left hand side of that graph where vaccines sit, where the return on the investment is reasonably good along with the uh, public health education. And the economists are much more interested in the right hand end where you do things like uh, unnecessary diagnostic tests. A third of all blood tests that get sent by GPs to the pathology services are never even seen by the GP, let alone by the person whose uh, results have been taken. And that's a huge waste of resources and also a potential risk, of course, to the patients. Uh, but uh, that and adverse drug reactions obviously de decrease your quality adjusted years of life and can cost money. Uh, but it has to be pointed out, well, that's the economist's view. We don't live in an economy, we live in a society. And that's really the important point. We actually have personal feelings about healthcare. We know this because... <laughs> I'm obviously an amateur at driving this. I usually don't have that problem. Uh, we spend about... Uh, 2.1 billion a year on drugs that are prescribed by a doctor. Uh, and these, obviously, we hope are useful drugs, although some of them probably aren't. But we actually spend just as much on over-the-counter vitamins and mineral supplements every year, which are of no value, proven of no value, not just not proven to be valuable, but proven of no value. We make a decision about what we would really like based on what we think we need. People are basically saying we have a, that they want to do something which will improve the quality of their health uh, without having to work too hard. So we take a pill. And uh, of course the pills don't work, but it stops us feeling guilty about the fact that we smoke too much, drink too much, we're overweight and we don't exercise. So we take a pill. Uh, we've got to try and save that money because that money that's spent there could be spent on health research and it is a large amount of money even in comparison with the amount that the Medical Research Future Fund will make available for health and medical research. We, this is just a, one quick snapshot to tell you the, health, the Medical Research Future Fund is alive and well. It has given out money this year already, $60 million. It will give out money next year, $121 million. And all the expenditure over the next five years is already approved and in the forward estimates. It's just not public domain information yet. So that there is a promise of that money coming out, much according to the timetable there. And eventually the handout will reach $1 billion a year. But just remember that I just told you that we effectively waste $2 billion a year on drugs that we don't really need, that don't do any good, and that we take to solve our conscience about not behaving ourselves. So we have to also get education into the system somehow. I really don't think it's me that's the problem. So I'm going to give a talk now, which I gave last week, which is basically the, the theme of the conference was about global equity and discovery science, and the, the, the proposition was that we get, that basically we make the disparity between rich and poor worse by the technologies and health that we introduce. That may well be true for some technologies, although I personally don't believe that that's actually the case. But what I'm going to show you is an example of where we are challenged with something which is a benefit across the community and isn't disadvantaging people, but it's just difficult to get it out there. So cervical cancer 
is a preventable disease. Uh, the, uh, it's a problem in the developing world mostly. The countries in red on the map there are where the burdens of cervical cancer are greater. And we now recognize that that disease is caused 100% by virus infection, the virus being human papillomavirus. And while there are about 200 different human papillomaviruses, about 10 of them are responsible for cervical cancer. And two of those are responsible for 70% of the burden of cervical cancer. So this is a challenge that we face, which uh, there have been ways suggested to treat papillomavirus infection. This one um, I don't particularly recommend. On the other hand, 560 people on Facebook actually do recommend it. Uh, it's a little worrying. But to be a little more serious about it, the way that we actually treat cervical cancer at the moment is not that different from a shotgun. It's destructive therapy and not particularly pleasant and it doesn't always work. So it would be much better if we could prevent the infection in the first place and preventing papillomavirus infection is what the vaccine of course is all about. So Harold Zerhausen made that possible by the discovery back in 1980 that papillomaviruses were responsible for at least some cervical cancer. Uh, these viruses are uh, ones which we can't grow in the lab. Most vaccines are made by growing up viruses in the lab and either killing the virus or rendering it safe so it won't cause disease, and then using that to induce immunity protection against infection. But uh, this particular virus only grows in skin and will not grow in the lab. Fortunately, in 1990, my colleague Jan Zhu and I came up with a technology which allowed us to make something that looks like the virus in the lab. We used recombinant DNA technology, which was a new technology then, to make these virus-like particles, which look sufficiently like the virus empty they are, but they are, the, the coat is there, and that coat induces a protective immune response. It took 15 years for the companies to turn what we could do in a swimming pool into uh, a test tube, into what they could do in a swimming pool. We do lots of interesting things in swimming pools, but that's another story. Uh, the, uh, the cost of the work that we did was about $100,000. The cost of what the companies did was about two billion dollars. Now that's again two billion dollars that we could save from not using non-prescription drugs. Funny how these figures keep coming back to haunt us. But the point is we now have a vaccine and it works and it is 100% effective for practical purposes at preventing the pre-cancer condition that we have to treat to CIM3 which is what you find in an abnormal pap smear that requires treatment. So long as you only test whether the vaccine is working in people who've not yet been infected with the virus. If you've already been infected with the virus, the vaccines do nothing. They do not alter your risk of future disease. And of course, the vaccine that we currently have only protects against two strains of the virus, which is responsible for about 70% of cancer. Though the new one, which is coming out next year, which is based on the same technology, protects against nine strains of the virus and basically 95% of cervical cancer. These vaccines do work, uh, but they only work if you get them before you get the virus. So if you immunize a cohort of women who are under 14, these are data for Julia Brotherton and her colleagues, uh, you can see that the vaccines give you about 70% reduction in the risk that you will get cervical precancer, also infection. That's what you'd expect because these viruses, the two viruses that are in the vaccine, are responsible for about 70% of cervical precancer. So that's a good result, that's what we'd expect. But if you immunize an older population, a 17-year-old population, many of these women have been already exposed to the virus, they've got the virus, and therefore they are still at risk of disease. The vaccine is not nearly so effective. So the message is obviously give the vaccine early. The real problem is getting this vaccine where it's needed. The countries in green are the countries where this, virus, where this vaccine is routinely used, at least in some populations, Australia and North America, some European countries, some South American countries. The blobs in purple are the, reflect the prevalence of cervical cancer in, this, in that first picture that I showed you. And they're not in the same place. Cervical cancer is a disease where the vaccine is not used. Uh, so we've been doing studies in developing world countries to just make sure that it's possible to deliver the vaccine, or at least to make sure that the local population can deliver the vaccination if they are given vaccine. So it's, Vanuatu is a near neighbor island of Australia, and it has a major problem with cervical cancer. It's also a very poor country with, an, uh, with a 
uh, a true GDP of less than 300 US dollars a year once you, dis once you discount all the money that the Australian banks siphon through Vanuatu, which actually puts that figure up to about $2,000 a year. But that's money that the local population never see. So cervical cancer is a very common disease there. We surveyed 500 well women in Port Vila, and five out of the 500 had cervical cancer walking the streets. They didn't know they had it. And another uh, 40 or so had pre-cancer that would progress to cervical cancer in their lifetime. So the real challenge, obviously, is to get the vaccine into that community. And we thought it might be difficult to get the kids to come back to get three shots of vaccine. So we did a study where the hypothesis was that we needed to give them a reminder to come back. As it happens, we didn't need to give them the reminder, so I'm not going to talk about that study anymore. But I can show you that we could deliver the vaccine there. The challenge in Vanuatu is that you've got a small population, a quarter of a million people spread over a large number of islands, uh, with very little in the way of medical attention, only 25 doctors for the whole 250,000, which is not a good ratio. But a much worse ratio is the ratio of parliamentarians to doctors that they have there. Uh, four parliamentarians for every doctor. Uh, Canberra would be very, very full if we had that ratio here. And, we, and they have no vaccine fridge there. It's in the ho French hospital. It had an earthquake 30 years ago. The hospital's falling down. The vaccine fridge is in the basement. And it's the only bit of the hospital that's still used. So it's no surprise that it doesn't always work. Uh, education is critical for getting vaccines or any other public health measure taken up. And so education was an important part of the program that we did there. It was actually done by the Nivanu nursing staff. The district nurses went out and educated the parents, the children, the teachers, and the government officials, and told them all about the vaccine over the course of a year. And at the end of that, we were able to ensure that Vanuatu, Nivanu people delivered the vaccine in Vanuatu as effectively as we did in Australia. The, about 80% of the population was covered in Vanuatu and Fatty Island in the, year, the first year that we did the study, and that would be about the same as we were achieving in Australia. And about 93% of them came back to get all three shots. That was done through a schools program, which is effective. We went, the Australian Cervical Cancer Foundation, on whose board I used to sit, then went and did similar studies in uh, Bhutan, another country with a low GDP. Uh, and with a rather different approach to healthcare there. The cervical cancer, as I've shown on the right hand side there, just happens to be the commonest cancer amongst women in Bhutan. And again, it's a young population, and therefore that's why the cancer is the commonest one. Uh, the reason that it was possible to get a vaccine program done there was because of the young, the, the young woman in between my wife and me. Uh, she's 85 years old, she is the royal grandmother. Uh, and she decided that her country should be vaccinated. So you have a patron for a program and it works. Uh, she, the, within a year of her deciding the kids should be vaccinated, all of the school age kids of the right age were vaccinated, or so they say. It certainly must have been approximately right given the population dem demographics there. The interesting thing is what happened the following year because they changed the program from being delivered in schools to being delivered in district health clinics and the, and the uptake of vaccine halved. And that carried on for three years and then they went back to giving it to schools again and it went back up to near 100% coverage. Message is very clear, catch them while they're young, catch them while you can get them. So this is the bit that I find a bit distressing, you know, 10 years into the program, we've had this vaccine for 10 years. We've delivered over 200 million doses of vaccine worldwide. Now, if that big yellow box there represents all the women who are alive today who are going to get cervical cancer because they're potentially at risk of getting the infection worldwide, that's, court, that's, that's 25 million worldwide right now that are going to get cervical cancer. Theoretically, if we immunized all of the, if we'd given all those 200 million doses equally across the planet, then that little blue box down there would represent the two million lives saved as a consequence. In practice, because most of the vaccine has been delivered in the developed world where cervical cancer screening occurs and we can treat cervical cancer, that tiny little green box down there is actually the number of lives we've saved by the vaccine program to date just 10,000. So clearly we have a problem to solve there. We need to find a way of getting that vaccine out there. So I'll come up with a sort of a solution for you and see what you think. When the studies were originally done to prove that the vaccines worked, the 
all of the subjects in the studies were theoretically given three doses of vaccine. Uh, but of course not everybody came and got all three doses. And the, patient, the studies were followed up for five years so that it was possible to check to see who got infected, who had been given the vaccine once, twice, or three times. And when you then look, I mean, the numbers are small for one and two doses, but the point is that the protection level as observed against infection five years out was pretty much the same, whether you had one dose, two doses, or three doses of the vaccine. So that the reality is that you could start to think about this as an epidemic disease, not an endemic disease, and do mass immunization to control a virus which only infects humans. And so that you could come up with a strategy which basically says, we immunize a broad age range. At the moment, we just immunize 12-year-olds or 10-year-olds, whatever age people start to become sexually active. We immunize as either in schools, as we do at the moment, or we do a mass immunization across the entire population. If you're going to do it mass immunization, one dose would do the trick. If we're going to do it through schools, we can carry on doing two doses. 16 and 18 may be enough, because that's a cheaper vaccine than the nine that bail and one which will come along. But we do know from the studies done in Australia that long before we start immunizing boys, already the prevalence of HPV infection in immunized young women had fallen by 90%, as had the prevalence in young boys. So that there was a herd immunity effect where even if you only immunize 70% of the girls, that is enough to produce a 90% reduction in the burden of infection over seven years. So clearly, you can very rapidly get a reduction in the population without having to achieve universal immunization. So that given the eff efficacy of herd immunity, maybe a single dose mass immunization program would be the most cost effective way to go to control this virus across the planet. And I was asked to show the comparison with polio. This is interesting because I think it puts it in perspective. We're trying to eradicate polio from this planet. It infects humans only, as papillomavirus does. Lifetime risk of getting the infection it, in the pre-vaccination era was about 50% for both viruses. Lifetime risk of serious disease, paralytic polio, 1% of infected people, death, 0.1%. Cervical cancer, 2% of infected people, deaths, 0.8%. And that's in a country where you can actually treat the cancer, 2% if you're in the developing world. The annual death rate in the United States from polio in the year before they introduced universal immunization, 3,100 people died in the last big epidemic of polio in the United States, and 21,000 were left with disabling paralysis. In the last year before the papillomavirus vaccine became available in the United States, 3,900 women died of cervical cancer. Now this in a country where they're supposed to be screening for cervical cancer and it's a treatable disease. Nevertheless, 3,900 deaths and 12,000 women diagnosed with cervical cancer and presumably effectively treated. So the two diseases rank equally, in my opinion, for need to be eradicated. And of course we have effective vaccines for both of those and the vaccines are equally safe. In fact, actually, the papillomavirus vaccine is safer than the poliovirus live vaccine, which occasionally causes paralytic polio. Very rarely, I must point out, which is why. But we've moved to killed vaccines for polio in this country now, and in most countries in the world, in an attempt to get rid of polio. So I would point out and just simply say, let's get rid of papillomavirus, have a global campaign, mass immunization. It would be gone within a generation. And I acknowledge that this is work that's been done by many people in my lab, many people elsewhere. I've acknowledged the people that have actually done the work from the studies that I've mentioned on the slides, but that if you want to know exactly who did them, I can tell you that as well. Okay, and of course funding bodies are important for this, which brings me back to money. And that's exactly what you're all here to hear about, so let's hear about some money. Uh, so we have an Australian health system uh, which obviously looks after us. And these are the, these are the official uh, pillars of the health system, which health, investing in health and medical research is the one which I'm, of course, most interested in. And between the, na the, national, the National Health and Medical Research Council, the Medical Research Future Fund, and the Biotechnology Future Fund, it's estimated that $6 billion will be poured into med health and medical research in this country over the next five years. Pretty impressive. The government agenda has the Medical Research Future Fund and the Biotech Medical Translation Fund 
at the top of their list for translational and innovative outcomes, along with a number of other science research priorities which are listed there. These are reports which governments produce to try and encourage us to see which way they're thinking about how to spend the money. Uh, the National Health and Medical Research Council, of course, has a major responsibility for uh, health and medical research in this country, you know that. But I think the important thing that I want to stress is that, well, uh, there are two things I want to stress. First of all, there is no intent to take any responsibility away from the National Health and Medical Research Council as a result of the Medical Research Future Fund being available. The, the, the two are additive, and the one is not going to trade off against the other. And I think that's quite important to understand. The, Na the National Health Medical Research Council is charged with being responsible for all health and medical research in this country, and that is not going to change. The second thing is that the National Health and Medical Research Council is there as one of the vehicles through which the money from the Medical Research Future Fund can be distributed. They have the necessary skill set and programs in place which allow some of the goals of the Medical Research Future Fund to be met, particularly in the area of clinical trials, particularly in the area of practitioner fellowships. But these are two areas where the, MR, where the MRFF will provide extra funding for areas which the National Health Medical Research Council already look after. There are also health challenges through the National Science and Research Priorities, and basically they are concerned with health care systems. And that's one of the areas which will definitely fall within the remit of the Medical Research Future Fund. The models by which we deliver health care are not that much changed from the days of uh, Hippocrates. It's a transaction between an individual and their doctor. Money changes hands and there's a treatment given out. Health care these days is going to be thought of in rather different terms, I suspect, because we have to, as you already know, plan for population health in a much greater way than we've done in the past. I mean, we do these population health things, but we do not use the population as a database for helping us to plan health better, except, of course, for the 45 and half fund uh, program and a few similar programs which are designed specifically to do that. So you're in a good space because it's an area where, with increasing interest in personalized medicine, precision medicine, and big data, things are going to change in the future. And the Medical Research Future Fund is certainly charged in some senses with responsibility in that area. Uh, the, the NHMRC is formally charged, by the way, with supporting the delivery of funding from the Medical Research Future Fund, but it will not be the only vehicle through which that is done. Uh, and the, uh, without giving any trade secrets away, we've been talking extensively with government about having an Office of Medical Research set up as the vehicle through which the Medical Research Future Fund might well in the future be distributed. Uh, there are a little problem with actually funding that because the one thing we can't do with the MRFF money is provide support for how you spend the MRF money. The Act actually precludes that, but we can at least ensure that government realises they have responsibility in that area. So that's the figures that I showed you previously, and as I say, the one in blue there has already been given out last year, but it was done relatively quietly. Half the people I talked to think the Medical Research Future Fund died immediately after the announcement that the government made some three years ago that it would come into existence, because they haven't seen the evidence that it's out there. But the extra practitioner fellows who were appointed this year all know that they were appointed as MRFF fellows, and the clinical trials space has increased by a considerable amount of 60 million extra dollars put in this year already for clinical trials. So we were charged some two years ago, we being the board that I chaired, uh, with setting up some st a strategy and some priorities for the expenditure of the money to recommend to the minister. I should stress that we are obliged to recommend to the minister. The minister is not obliged to follow our recommendations, uh, but we're working on that. Uh, so that we were thinking about most of the strategy was mostly about the sort of things you would think about, and I've mentioned already, we need to work on using data more effectively to plan health services. We need to work on the systems that we deliver health care through to make sure that, if you like, do health services research to make sure we're doing a good job. We need to encourage more capacity in the system. 
and that's certainly something we will be doing. And more collaboration, particularly international collaboration. We are a small country, we're the size of California in terms of population, and we are part of a global network in health, and I think we have to make sure that we remember that, and where we can do things more effectively through collaboration, we should. We are very keen to focus on the translational end of research. The Medical Research Future Fund is much more translational than the, end, the average NHMRC a grant awarding system is allowed to be because remember that the NHMRC is bottom up driven. People put in proposals and they are either funded or not. The MRFF has strategies top down and while individuals will get the money and individuals will be responsible for delivering what they do, we can set framework agendas within that to ensure that the right sort of things that we see as important get done. The MRFF is also about commercialization, but it's not about the Biotechnology Future Fund where you've got something which already looks like it's going to make money for someone. It's about getting something to the stage where it might be interesting to some spec, some, somebody who's prepared to put money in some venture capital fund or the Biotechnology Future Fund. So if you like, the first valley of death in clinical trials. I have a long list of priorities here which I could go through with you, but they're already out of date. All right, I'll just, I mean, I'll put them up there. You can read them if you're a speed reader. There are three slides of them. They're on the website if you want to get to them. But the important point to realize is these priorities were set by a very rapidly done consultation process two years ago when we were required within a period of two months to come up with a list of priorities for how the money should be spent. And despite the fact that we went around and consulted widely, uh, we, uh, the one message that came out of that, by the way, was that everybody thought that their particular disease was much commoner than the figures suggested and much less well funded than it deserved to be. Surprise, surprise. So you'll find that there are very few diseases mentioned in there for a very good reason. Rather, it's all to do with broader picture stuff. So uh, you, as I say, I'll just leave those up very briefly for you can have a look at, you can see what's there. I am very keen, by the way, to encourage this idea of a National Institute of, of, research, of Medical Research like we have in the UK. That's a, a model which I understand and one which has done a good job there. And I think that we probably need to try and develop something very similar here. And perhaps most importantly, at the other end, there's the trials and translation and commercialization. As I say, it's all on the website if you want to go and have a look. But we will be going around and doing another round of consultations next year. Next year, our challenge is to get more involvement from the community. And we have to think about that. And I would be interested from you in how you might think that that should happen. Because that's one of the big challenges. We get, to, we were lectured at, I think would be the best description, by groups of people who said they represented the community, but came with very little proof that they actually did. Uh, and I think that it's quite important to understand what the general community expect in health, particularly when we're starting talking about using data and aggregate research across populations and me electronic medical records. People are quite nervous about that. They want to know that their data will be secure. They want to know how we're going to use it. And I think we have to find out what they're concerned about so we can alleviate their anxieties. So the first disbursements were given out uh, they were announced in the budget uh, last year and basically quite a large part of it went into translational research, clinical trials and then a little bit of money which is described as break breakthrough science which is actually what was the minister's picks uh, um, and I'll not go into any further comment on that except to say that the implementation of that money has been carrying on and basically all the little green ticks of where we've actually given it all out and most of the rest of it is in, process, in progress for being given out. And if anybody wants a copy of that, I can quite happily give them it because that's all public domain information. It's basically saying that we've spent the money. Uh, more importantly, you'll hear over the course of the next couple of months, probably before the mid-year estimates, how the rest of the money over the next five years is going to be distributed. Uh, the minister likes to distribute these things piece by piece, which I understand. Uh, they have more impact that way on the general public, let's be faced, honest, but it also gives us a bit of time to plan. Uh, and there, there are going to, the Minister likes missions, so we're going to have missions. Uh, these missions, 
Yes, well, the, the, well, they're better than moon shots, let's face it. <laughs> There's only one moon, you can only shoot it at once. Um, but the, there will be quite a lot of money for pro programs for where people get together with a vision of something that they can do usefully together in five years. World class, best people in Australia, and needing a significant amount of money to get it to happen. And this will be a big opportunity for people who like the 45 and up project, where you can come up with something that will be deliverable within five years. Um, and it will complement the activities of NHMRC. It will not supplant any part of that. And we're working on the administration strategies. But there will be quite a large chunk extra for clinical trials, for clinical training and research, something which has been really underdone in this country. I don't know how it is in your state, but in our state we lost a whole generation of clinical researchers when the government moved to funding for service delivered rather than funding hospitals because suddenly there wasn't any money for training researchers, not clinicians and clinician researchers anyway. Uh, my job as chair of the advisory board is to keep the government honest. Um, and my board and I try to do that as best we can. We have passed through the minister, approved by him and cabinet, a set of principles under which the money is to be dispersed. Basically, those principles say that all funding must be open and competitive. Uh, that doesn't mean it will be open in the sense you can do anything you like with it, but within the area that a call for proposals might be made, there has to be an open and contestable process and there will be peer review and there will be uh, uh, follow-up on how you're using the money. I mean, there will be performance indicators and if you get five years of money, you probably better be beating your performance indicators because there will be control over that in a way that doesn't happen with NHMRC funding at the moment. We will be looking, I mean, the focus on burden and unmet needs, needs is a, a minister speak for saying, I would like to have a few of my own projects, thank you very much. And we will obviously have to recognise that governments have to look after what they see as important as well as what we see as important. But there will be major changes in the way that things get done as about the way the money is given out. It's not just another NHMRC. And we will be consulting extensively over next year about the priorities for the future. We're charged with doing them every two years. I'm kind of hoping they won't change too often, because uh, otherwise we're going to be chopping and changing a lot. But we do need to consult more than we managed at the time to do last time around. The Biomedical Translation Fund and us, we thought, try to work together, you know, that we should be meeting a bit of the process of getting things which might become commercialised to the point where the Biomedical Translation Fund see it as desirable. We kind of hope that we could partner with them, but the way that they're set up, it doesn't really work quite like that, so we just have to look for opportunities that might lead in that general direction. They're spending their money reasonably well, but they also have to try and return a profit, whereas we don't. So uh, we are very clearly in the space of leading into things, and we don't mind if the money goes out there and there's no profit involved, so long as it's well used. Uh, so clinical trials capacity improvement is something which everybody was asking for. That was the one universal feature of the request we got from virtually every group that we consulted with last year. And so there is a significant amount of money basically to get some coordination into clinical trials in this country so that we can, some part of it is to enable more clinical trials but some part of it is actually to get set up infrastructure to make clinical trials across the country work better than has been possible in the past. It's disappearing act again. No, no perhaps not that one. <laughs> Never mind. It's pretty much done anyway, actually. But, uh, let's see if we can get it to go back to where I was. No, maybe not. Okay, well, look, look. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's fine. That was maybe the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> Accusing people inappropriately. Uh, look, we, that, that, what I've tried to do is give you a little snapshot of what is going on and what will go on. It is going to be a case of watching the space for opportunities. Uh, but they will be more extensively advertised than we've been doing up till now because obviously first of all there's more money and secondly last year we really had to deliver what the minister would have called shovel ready projects. The money had to get out the door by an appropriate date 
and therefore it had to be spent pretty quickly. Now we have time to plan, and therefore there will be much more consultation both about uh, what we will be doing in the future and making sure that you collectively are aware of how the money is being distributed, where it's meant to go, and the opportunity to talk with us and the board about things. But one request, please. Do not lobby the minister. He's had 300 submissions to him personally, ranging in scope from $10,000 requests to the biggest one was a $100 million request. And all he does is send them to us, and all we do is file them. So please just work through the system. Do not use the minister as a conduit to getting the money. Thank you very much for your attention.